Okay, so this is part three of the rise and fall of Christian civilization, which we're going to talk about some of the textures and, and nuances of the medieval era, namely the differences between Eastern and Western Christianity and some of the factors that were going on then. But this is a very complicated, long thousand years, and so understand that what we're saying here is, is by necessity in terms, again, as most of these lectures are, in terms of the broad brush strokes. So lots of generalizations, but hopefully they're helpful generalizations to kind of get you some, some footholds into understanding this era better and what we're talking about in this lecture series. So just to give you a few, a few date kind of touch points here, because uh, not that history is about memorizing dates, but dates can help kind of give you, like I said, a foothold. So when we're looking at uh, this issue of Christianity and the, and, the and the Roman Empire as Eastern and Western uh, divisions and how they developed, so when we're talking about this development, the first thing is in the 3rd and 4th century, so that's 200s and 300s, that's how that works, uh, this is when the empire is divided. Uh, let's put that down here. Officially, into the Eastern and Western empires, and they work together, they collaborate, but there's going to be a drift over time. And then 476, of course, is the, the fall of the Western part of the empire, And all of these are complex, interesting historical points that we're just skipping. And then 1054, so about 500 years later, is the sort of nominal date of what's called the Great Schism between the Eastern and Western churches. But that is, again, more complicated because there wasn't a single event that touched all of this off exactly. And then... I guess we would say for, for scholasticism, which we'll get to, you know, the 1200s through the 1300s are really the high period of medieval Western scholastic thinking. So that kind of maybe gives you some time stamps of about a few centuries about the major, major events that are going on in terms of the East-West division in our story, let's say. Okay. So, so, so let's go straight into the schism then. So the great schism between the Eastern and the Western churches, very simply, is that by this point in history, by you know, year 1000 or so, all of Christianity throughout the Mediterranean world was organized under what we call patriarchates, which are the highest level seats of the bishop that that rules over other bishops and lesser bishops and then over local priests and so on. The best way to think about this is as a representative democracy. Like we have, you know, representatives at your local level, your city level, you know, and then your state level, and then going up the ranks in, that's how the United States works, right? You have this kind of representative tiers where this guy represents everyone at this tier and each one of those represents everybody at a lower tier and so on. That's exactly how the church was organized. Same thing. So the patriarch of an area is just the highest ranking bishop who has authority over all the other bishops in his area. And they were divided into five what we call sees, S-E-E-S, -E -E which are like seats or, or domains or whatever you want to call it across the ancient world. So those were Rome, Alexandria, Constantinople, Jerusalem, and Antioch. And those, from those five seats, that's how Christianity was ruled. And if you look at it on a map, geographically, you will see that in the west is the Roman seat, the, the Roman sea. And then the other four are all on, on the eastern side, and they're close together. So, so, so Rome is kind of isolated geographically a little bit in a certain sense, and that will be important as we go. So let's put that there. And then the driving force, let's say, is a slow cultural separation between east and west 
in the West, they gradually stop speaking Greek and only speak Latin. In the, in the East, they gradually stop speaking Latin and they only speak Greek. So there's a language barrier that slowly develops. There's a cultural barrier that slowly develops that exacerbates the geographical barrier. Because remember, they don't have computers. They don't have phones. They don't even have like mail that just like goes instantaneously. You want a message delivered, you have to have somebody run it or put it on a boat. It takes months to get there. So low rate of exchange of information in the ancient world means that there's a general kind of gradual cultural shift. There are a lot of factors that I'm going to just move over quickly. And so you get to this point where the two halves of Christendom and of the empire don't have a shared theological language anymore. They sort of develop independent kind of instantiations of the theology. They, have, they develop different ways of doing things. They have a language barrier. And it all finally comes to a head when, there's a couple of reasons, but basically the Roman church excommunicates the Constantinople and Constantinopolitan church. And... Uh, that is what leads to the Great Schism. So that's a whole story. Uh, a bull of excommunication was, let's spell this right, was placed on the altar at Constantinople by a delegate from Rome, officially excommunicating Constantinople from the shared Christian world. And it seems like Rome was expecting the other three patriarchates to follow his example and to side with him, but they didn't. They all sided with Constantinople. So you get this, you get this four-in-one split in Christianity. So the one goes off to the west, that's the Bishop of Rome, and gradually develops into what we now today call Roman Catholicism. And then the four other bishops go into the east, and develop into what we now call Eastern Orthodoxy. And those are just the sort of the two main divisions of Christianity. Functionally, at, at a basic level, they are all very much the same. There's priests and clergy and bishops and sacraments and the Eucharist and communion and baptism and confession and icons and all, all kinds of, all the same features of ancient sacramental Christianity, which is a topic for another discussion. They're functionally the same, but there's two so functionally, but there's two really important differences that they still argue about today. One is what we call the filioque, filioque, which is Latin for and the sun. That's that division there. Um, that's not a D. Maybe I should take this out. And then the other is, of course, um, let's call it role of the Pope. So... In excommunicating Constantinople, the, the Bishop of Rome, i.e. who we now call the Pope, was kind of making a statement about his authority over the other bishops, and they said they prefer in the East what we call a conciliar model, where everybody kind of cooperates and collaborates and works things out together. And in the West, there is this insistence that the, that the Bishop of Rome has sort of a special authority over the other ones, over the other bishops, that is, and that's a whole that's a whole complex topic. Whether or not, to what extent, these claims are made or meant, in what way, uh, there's a lot of nuance there that I don't want to fail to do justice here. But but a, but an apt summary is that the things that these these two branches of Christianity disagree about are the authority of the Pope in relation to the other bishops, i.e. the authority of the Bishop of Rome in relation to the other bishops, and the filioque. What's the filioque? It, it means and the Son, which is a line that gets added to the Nicene Creed. What's the Nicene Creed? The Nicene Creed is the joint statement of what Christianity is that was developed by the fathers of the church and all the bishops and the consensus of all the bishops of Christianity in the fourth century. And that was after Christianity became legal. All the bishops got together. They said, okay, well, what do we believe? What books are the Bible? What are the normative church practices? And they had multiple councils. And all the bishops came together and decided on these things. So the church universally held the same beliefs and practices. There were no denominations. And that was very functional. That was a good thing. 
And a statement, the most important statement perhaps that they produced was the, what we now call the Nicene Creed, which states the basic beliefs of everything that you need to sort of understand and acknowledge and incorporate to be considered a Christian. Because there are, of course, all sorts of people making up wacky stuff that wasn't consistent with all the Christian ideas that we talked about in previous lectures. So the idea was that this is the universal statement of what it means to be a Christian, and in the West they added a line to it. And the Eastern objection is, hold on, you can't just add stuff to the universal creed. That's the purview and property of all Christians. We all need to have another council and all collaborate and all have consensus if we're going to change that statement. And that's a valid complaint. Why did they choose to add this line? Because of certain theological ideas that are way too boring for you to get into right now. I don't actually think they're boring. Uh, they're very interesting if you're interested in, like I said in a previous lecture, some of the developments of logic and, and what it entails. Because remember guys, whenever you change your fundamental beliefs about the ultimate nature of reality, that's going to affect everything else in your life. So when you make these little changes to the technical way that the Trinity works, which is what this is about, it's going to affect Christianity at a profound level, and I think it does, and so I think it's worth, it's not just worth objecting to the filioque from the Eastern perspective on the basis that there's some authority problem. You can't just change that without consulting everybody. That's true. That's like changing your contract like without telling anybody. But there's also theological issues, which we can get into later if you're interested. Anyway, so those two things are kind of what drive and then ultimately create the schism and that still need to re be resolved today between the Bishop of Rome and the four other ancient bishops. All right, so just very briefly, what are the two kind of, what are two of the most iconic, let's say, spirits or perspectives that develop in the East and the West? Well, in the West, the most famous one is scholasticism, which is the height of the medieval university. It's very logic-driven. It's very process-driven. They, they come up with all these complex logical methodologies to attack problems and to, to do discourse in a certain way. And it's very, very, uh, let's call it intellectualized. That's a uh, yeah, let's say intellectualized. And that is the that is sort of the stereotype of Western Christianity is that it's very, very mind oriented, very logic oriented, and all the sort of rigorous and rigid uh, spirit that comes with that kind of process is sort of in inherent to the whole medieval system. And it's much more hierarchical too. Maybe I'll put that up here. So. This is, this is a function of, in the West, there were lots of what you would call barbarians, non-Greek, non-Roman people groups. And so for the, for, the, for the clergy to sort of run the church, there ends up being this accidental divide because they're speaking Latin. The common people aren't always speaking Latin. They can't always read, of course, and then there's, so it kind of develops into this stratified system in the West where there's sort of this elite clergy who, who are intellectuals, that's the intellectual class really, and then the lay people kind of have to follow along with that, which can be very functional and fine, but it does sort of develop this spirit of separation between clergy and lay people, which we kind of see today even in Catholicism now, and that's a whole other story. The contrast is in the, uh, in the East, in the Byzantine Empire, it's, it's, let's say that in contrast to being intellectualized, and these are all, these are all gross oversimplifications, I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of that. But I just need keywords for you to put into your mind uh, to help you get a grip on the subject. So it's kind of more mystical in, in, in contrast to being intellectualized. What that means, there's a lot that that means, there's a lot to unpack there but they're not so focused on logic per se, but on all kinds of sort of mystical traditions, what we might call Eastern now, like Eastern spirituality, but this is like Eastern Christianity. Again, very generalized. And then as opposed to being hierarchical, it's much more, it's much more egalitarian in a certain sense, 
that sense is that the way things are organized, there's not just one supreme bishop, because in the West, remember, there's only the Bishop of Rome, who kind of, and then the whole hierarchy follows from that central point down like a pyramid, right? And in the East, there's not. There's four other bishops that are at the top. There's no one thing at the top. And so the whole church takes on a more what we call conciliar nature. Egalitarian would be the word now. It's kind of anachronistic to use it here, but maybe you, maybe you get the idea well enough. And then Byzantium is interesting. This is worth noting. Uh, Byzantium actually, so the, the, the Western Roman Empire as a political institution falls. Uh, and then there are, there are things that come after, and then what's going on with the Holy Roman Empire, that's a whole, there are multiple things that get called the Roman Empire. But one of them is the Byzantine Empire. So we call them the Byzantines now in retrospect, but they call themselves the Romans. And they, they lasted until, uh, until the 15th century, actually with the fall of Constantinople when the Ottomans destroyed them. So this thing actually lasts, lasts a really long time. It lasts, it's whatever Rome is, Christian Rome is, in the East, and it just, it just keeps lasting. Now, there's all kinds of things that, that happen that, that plague the East, you know, the Ottomans and, and all this kind of stuff, which get, we'll get into with Islam. But I just want to point that out, that this institution lasts a really long time and in some sense is more stable than in the West, although in another sense the West is more stable. But there's a deep, there's a deep kind of Greek thinking culture here, and this is a, a sort of a Latin thinking culture. Maybe you can put it that way. Okay, so Islam is a whole religion, obviously, and it's a very complicated story, all this kind of stuff. We won't get into that here. Uh, all I want to do is bring Islam into this story and to talk about the points uh, in which it's relevant to, to our story here of, of the Christian medieval world. And so the first point is that Islam is kind of an intermediary between these two, these two separated empires or churches, I mean, both really, cultural, cultural, political, and religious. They're separated geographically, linguistically, uh, and for many other reasons. But... What Islam does is it kind of bridges the gap between uh, these two halves of the empire. So let's call it uh, intellectually speaking is what I'm talking about. So it's this intermediary between East and West. How does this happen? Well, as the Byzantine Empire is kind of in its dying throes, people, well, also because... Uh, Muslims conquer a lot of the Eastern Empire, too, and so they inherit, when you conquer somebody, you inherit their intellectual artifacts and their cultural heritage and things like that. And so Islam inherited all sorts of Byzantine knowledge about geometry and theology and math and, and all this kind of stuff, and they took that, and Islam, Islamic scholars, you know, in their travels to the West— they brought those texts and translations of, let's say, Aristotle that they didn't have in the West. They brought them from the East to the West. So they're, they're, the trade routes were really important intellectually because ideas were able to come over uh, that were lost. Because when, during the schism, culturally, you know, there's not, there's not a good way to communicate. Also, linguistically, we talked about the language breakdown. So there's, there's, there's a whole... Uh, let's call it like a whole legacy of Christianity's intellectual legacy that each of the halves is kind of cut off from. And so when Islam brings a bunch of it from east to west, then suddenly the west has it, and that's a big deal. And, and that kind of is a big part that helps jumpstart the Renaissance. Obviously, that soil was already tilled by all the scholasticism and the, the Middle Ages stuff that we talked about in the last lecture. But... Islam is sort of an important intermediary in that story. And something that you'll hear that's inaccurate is that, well, you know, the West, the Western world was kind of in this state of intellectual stagnation, and then Islam came and revitalized it. The part of that story that's missing is the source of the revitalization, and Islam has it from Byzantium that they conquered. So they, it's kind of just like, bringing the two halves of Christianity's mystical and intellectual tradition back together. So that's important. All right, so that's that.
That's a lot, I know. On any given point, you can go off on, on all sorts of all sorts of very edifying and interesting tangents. But this is just kind of your roadmap for the period in terms of its, its place in our story of the rise and fall of Christian civilization. So next time, we're going to talk about the beginning of modernity, and we'll start with the Reformation. See you then.